This weekend represents this really unique and innovative effort to bring all of these many worlds together in one room with the aim of collectively advancing an agenda that really no one of us or one group could carry out on its own. We're starting with Alexander Horowitz speaking on the topic of unnaming and renaming animals. What I'm proposing is that both the field of animal cognition and the foibles of the field are part of a productive approach. The first step in considering animals is showing how they resemble us. By giving an animal a personal name, we become predisposed to see them at all and to see how they resemble us. So to do this, we have to name them, to make them individuals, to familiarize them. And then we have to unname their species, make them human show the resemblance between them and us. And then we have to make them again who they are, defamiliarize them and rename them. Now we're very excited to turn to Syl Ko. Syl is an independent researcher and co-author of Aphroism. And her work focuses on the intersection between decolonial thinking and animal ethics. Okay, so what is black veganism? It's an animal ethic is generated from within the anti-racist commitment. And so the argument of black veganism is the concept of human and the concept of animal understood racially inform how we think about non-human animals. That if you are a person who claims that you are anti-racist, you better have animals involved in your interrogation of racism. And if you are a person who claims that you wanna do something about animals, you better have race as a part of your understanding of the narrative of animality. We need to start talking about the narrative of animality and stop talking about animals. There's a narrative we tell ourselves and we are stuck in that narrative. Okay, and this is gonna be really important for understanding black veganism, that this is about changing how we as animal advocates think about animals. Dale Jamison, as many of you know, is a professor of environmental studies and philosophy. Dale is talking to us about the very big and very important topic, how to change the world. The most difficult challenge, I think, is to make the unthinkable thinkable. So once something like a plant-based diet becomes something people can contemplate, you're most of the way there. After it occurs, this sort of deep social change appears necessary and inevitable, and as if the weight of history was on its side. Honestly, the happy message is you may never know whether you succeeded in, in what you do. This cause we're all embarked on is larger than a single lifetime. And in some ways, the most important part of the reason for doing this is because it aligns your life with your values. I mean, however this story turns out, you will have lived a life that's meaningful to you. And this novel format over the weekend is meant to encourage us to meet with one another, to connect in formal, informal ways, to spark new conversations, ideas, collaborations, um, and to listen and learn from each other in a setting most intended to make that possible. When it comes to questions of what might have the greatest impact for animal protection change, for me, there are many different ways to make change. I think if I had one commonality that I most passionately believe in, it's about stories and narratives that allow us to change. And different factors in society and different individuals in society will require different stories in order to allow them to change. I think that no particular thing is going to by itself have the greatest impact for animal protection and change. I think that in order to make the change that we want to see, we need a broad pluralistic movement that involves 
lots of people taking different and seemingly conflicting approaches. We need moderate advocacy, we need radical activism, we need people pursuing social change, institutional change, political change, and technological change all at the same time. And people working on those issues from within academia, from advocacy, from a policy perspective. And if we can build that kind of pluralistic movement with that many different actors doing all of those different types of things, then those activities will work together in order to help us make progress on these issues. I think the greatest impact on animal protection change is twofold. First, it's embrace and facilitate diversity. But in order to do that, we have to do what Dale Jameson said earlier in the program about owning the language. And we really need to be able to get to the person on the street, as it were, to the general public or the majority. And we do so by incorporating all kinds of diverse language, but also by having truly language that reflects our values of the movement. The other part about language is the reason why we need to think about language and have a language that reflects those values is that language reflects habit, not thought. We need to work up and develop for the general public the habit of using the language of animal protection. So many people are involved in animal protection today. And we're all passionate, we all have great ideas, but sometimes we're not talking to each other. And so what happens is we see duplication of efforts and sometimes even working in counterproductive ways. So I think being able to communicate more, work together more effectively, come up with more global strategies that are interdisciplinary and intersectional, that's what we need to be focusing on. I think the animal protection movement should be asking really deep questions and asking society to consider really deep questions such as, why are we breeding animals? So we're, we're breeding them for multiple purposes, but are there other ways for us to live our lives without creating what we end up seeing as problems? An ultimate question is why are we doing this, right? And why are we not thinking about how we can live in harmony with the animals who already exist in the world? But law is how our society codifies its values. And so if we don't codify the changes in public demands and public opinions as to animals, this could be a very ephemeral or very symbolic moment for animals. And we want these changes to be real and we want them to last. And an important piece of that is making sure not just that these changes are codified in law, but that those changes are enforceable. The biggest challenge, I think, in animal protection is a traditional, long-standing perception of how we think of animals. So I think the biggest single change will be getting a sense of responsibility towards sentient animals. And then at, at an even higher level, it's about respect for sentience, respect for things that are alive because they're alive. Currently, this issue is affecting farmed animals and protecting farmed animals and reconstructing our food system is affecting more individual animals than any other issue. And we have to treat it like that, which means it should be considered an emergency. And it's not just affecting those farmed animals, it's affecting the survival of our planet, many, many other species, and ourselves. And we need to treat it with that kind of urgency, yet the kind of attention at the political, at the corporate, and at the philanthropic level, it's not reflective of that. And that has to change. And we have to think about how do we change that? I think the key to changing that is not thinking about it in silos, not thinking about it just, for example, from like a animal ethics perspective. We have to bring in all the arguments, all these things. We have to bring in all the elements and not just take a narrow approach down like one highway. We have to take we have to take over all the roads to get there. I think it's probably gonna take certainly information, also more linkages, more strategic work across organizations, also in some ways across movements. I think with the environmental movement, the climate change movement, uh, there are many, many people and organizations really concerned about biodiversity loss as well. I think we can find more linkages with those movements, especially around animal agriculture and exploitation of wildlife. I also think there is probably a need for more capacity development in varied ways. And we see the movement becoming more professional in terms of research, in terms of writing, in terms of analysis. I think that's great. I do still think there's a strong value in organizing and really movement building. The Brooks Institute promotes collaboration by encouraging us to create new connections among ourselves. 
And one of the fundamental beliefs I've seen is that new ideas can emerge when people work together, especially when those people are crossing boundaries that don't often get crossed.